Hi everyone, welcome to Five Code Shakespeare, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone Clips. If you like what you see, don't forget to like and subscribe, and be sure to visit my YouTube channel for a chapter-by-chapter -chapter analysis of the most important themes in the story. See the description for details. Thanks for watching. Hagrid is such a beloved character because we recognize in him something that we yearn for. Uh, as we've talked about, we yearn for the Dumbledore, and we yearn for something like the Hagrid. And what are they? Why? Why are these two archetypes so fundamental to who we are? Well, they represent in us uh, uh, two different aspects, two equally important aspects. Uh, it's, it's the, you remember studying your mythology? If you haven't studied it recently, go back and look at it because it's amazing. Uh, Apollo, the sky gods, the sun gods, Zeus, the sky gods. There's all these sky and sun gods out there. And what they represent is the higher aspects of our being, the intellectual aspects of our being. But the Greeks understood, the Greeks were really, really smart, and they understood that, yeah, we do have that, the noble high, but we also have the ignoble low, which is an energy that is just as important. And that's symbolized in the wild man uh, images, the wild man archetypes. They're all over the place. Uh, this is Dionysus Bacchus, the, the Greek god of, um, of, of wine and revels, but not just that. He was associated with all of the woodland creatures, with uh, the satyrs, the half uh, pan, the half man, half goat, that's half animal. That's the animal nature in us is what is symbolized by these characters. And that's exactly what we see here. Look at the gold, the gold and silver. Go back and watch my other videos. Gold and silver are the pure metals. Uh, they're the sky metals. They're, they're that, that, uh, that transcendent intellectual spiritual force in us but look at this he's always associated with green he's the earth we can't we have to recognize and honor the earth in us as well as the sky in us do you see what i mean that is really really interesting so let me just read through some of this because I, I find it fascinating so the sky and the sun gods are personifications of order you want to live in order. You want to live in a society that is ordered. You don't want chaos. But if you've got too much order, you've got what we've already talked about. You've got Professor Umbridge. You've got Filch. You've got too much order, and that's, that, that can crush your soul. Too much of the wildness. <laughs> yeah, you want wild. There's more places in the world where you can find wild. Go ahead if you want to. But you're too much wild and you're in trouble. Too much order, you're in trouble as well. So these sky gods are personifications of order, the mind, heaven, spirit, grace, God, the divine in us, the heavenly in us, reason, intellect, art, science, music, dance, beauty, symmetry, the high, the pure, the noble, the moral, the sublime in us. There is something in us that is sublime and we recognize it, we know it. When we see perfect beauty, we know it. When we see a building that's beautiful, there's something of the sublime. When we hear music that is beautiful, there's something of the sublime that we recognize, that we've pulled down from the heavens, for lack of a better metaphor. So, but the earth and the nature gods are equally important. They are personifications of the chaotic forces, Fred and George. Fred and George are forces of chaos in the later books productive chaos, constructive chaos. They, 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 a too rigid, overly conservative society needs to be shaken up. And that's what Fred and George do. So there is that as well. And that has to be honored too. So they're personifications of chaos, the body, the earth, the animal in us, fertility, the body, babies come from the body. They come from fertility. They come from the animal nature of us, DC, the passions, the physical life, Revels and drinking, sexuality, and worldly matters. Uh, he, Hagrid, too, kind of humor, humorously is there, there's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge uh, uh, about the connection between Bacchus, Dionysus, and Hagrid in, in the first. I'm thinking of the movie now where this actor, the wonderful actor, he says, when Harry, when Harry and the kids come to his hut uh, and he opens the door and says, Sorry, I'm in no fit state to entertain today. There's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge of, yeah, he was probably into his cups, do you see? So isn't that interesting, too? I wonder if that was J.K. Rowling's conscious decision or if that just kind of naturally emerged from in her imagination. These characters, these archetypes are, exist in her imagination, and she's projecting them onto the page. It's really, really interesting. Uh, so in a more negative light, so, so they represent something low, and I want to put low in italics here or, or in quotes because it's not necessarily, it's, it's low, but it's not, it's not unimportant. It's not. It's as equally important as our Apollonian nature. The low, the impure, the sinful, the ignoble, the corrupt. Too much of that cups is really, really bad. Uh, decay, rot in the way of all flesh. Now, this is why we. This is why we attempt 
to strive for something transcendent of the body because the body is a pretty nasty creature. If you're a young kid in your full bloom of youth, you don't know that yet, but if you look at your grandparents, yeah, yeah, it could be a really nasty creature. So there's this desire, like W.B. Yeats sailing to Byzantium to escape the trappings of, 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 the, of the worldly body for sure. So in literature, we see both depicted in our myths, in our religions, and in our great literatures, we see both of these aspects depicted equally revered. Both are requirements for, for, a, for a balanced uh, human existence. Both are honored in various forms in all cultures, and we ignore these at our peril. Uh, if you go back and watch my Hamlet videos, part of Hamlet's problem is that he wants to cut himself off from the wild man. He has no patience for it. He, all he sees is the corruption instead of the, the natural important energies of life. So go back and watch my Hamlet videos. Really, really interesting. Okay, so let's break down Hamlet uh, more specifically to the legend of the green man. If you've traveled in Europe and you've gone to the gorgeous cathedrals there, these monuments, these churches are monuments to that. They're monuments to Ap the Apollonian aspect of our being, the high, they are the sky gods, that they, those cathedrals are reaching into the sky, they're reaching for the sublime deity. But even on the walls of those cathedrals, you might see carved into them, the green man, you'll see Hagrid, there's an image of Hagrid there, the green man, just Google green man, you'll see what I'm talking about, he's, a, he's an ancient pagan symbol of rebirth, it's the fertility god, the Dionysian Earth energies is what the green man represents. And we are fascinated by these characters as we, are, as we adore uh, the children's version of that in Hagrid, do you see? So uh, ancient, the green man, the ancient pagan symbol of rebirth, it's Hagrid. Hagrid has haunted the churches of Europe for millennia because wise religions, wise mythologies, wise cultures recognize that we have both the high and the low in us and we have to cultivate both of those. And this is a gorgeous, cute little shrine uh, a worthy shrine to the wild man. Tellingly ignored by the Malfoys. The Malfoys want to live in this Apollonian realm. Do you see? The Malfoys are so snobby. They're so aristocratic. They only see, they only want to see that in themselves. And so they become half creatures. Like Hamlet, they can become, there's a schizophrenic crack up, do you see, uh, that, that, that makes them dysfunctional as, 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 as humans, lacking something severe, severely lacking something. They're, they're lacking the Hagrid. You want to get rid of your Hagrid? You don't want to get rid of your Hagrid. Cultivate your Hagrid. So, wise. High civilization is incomplete without due reverence for an expression of the low. You have to express that low somewhere. You have to express the Hagrid somewhere. You have to honor your, you have to go to the shrine of your Hagrid in some form. And J.K. Rowling, again, brilliantly, all these seven books, they've got the complete, they've got a complete uh, uh, a pantheon, a Greek pantheon of all the forces of, of what it means to be human in those seven books. And this is one of them. It's really important. It's really interesting. And this is why I said in my first video that she's one of the most important writers of the last hundred years, I think. So the wild man archetype reconnects us to something that many of us have lost. On a simpler level too, we just want to get back to nature. We're such an urbanized society here. We are living like the Malifoy so much in an Apollonian realm through our arts, do you see what I mean? Through our technology, technology, my God, the microchip. The microchip is something sublime that we've plucked out of our, I don't know, our the, the wiring, the, the, the sublime wiring of our brains. How did we do that? It's insanity. Uh, but yeah, we also want to hang out with the rabbits and the deer. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so he, he, here's a quote, and we can see what he's associated with. Hagrid lived in a small wooden house, of course, on the edge of the forbidden forest. He is associated with nature. He let the children in, struggling to keep hold of, the, of an enormous black boarhound. He's associated with nature, with animal, with the animal world. So he's got one foot in the animal world, one foot in the sublime. There was only room, for, there was only room, there was only one room inside. Uh, hams, here we go, the animal world. Hams and pheasants were hanging from the ceiling. A copper kettle was boiling on an open fire. There's the primitiveness, the positive primitiveness. And in a corner stood a massive bed with a patchwork quilt over it. So the wild man with just the right 
kind and amount of wild. Now, if you do some research into the wild man, you, you go ahead. There's, there's lots to be said about it. And he can be very, very negative because, of course, a wild man is wild, and that implies violence. And so you do get this in the medieval depiction of the wild man. You do get, uh, uh, first, you get the negative depiction of it, something that you don't want to be. But then it turns. It turns later on in Western civilization. I'm talking about primarily here. But, it, but aspects of this, variations of this probably exist in almost all cultures. Uh, then he turned into something more positive that we see in Hagrid. So at the height of medieval Christianity, the wild man represented the, the, a negative by which civilized Europeans could define themselves. Now, we very often define ourselves by a negative. For example, Canadians define themselves as, oh, I'm not American. I'm not British. I'm Canadian, you see. So you define yourself by a negative. And that's what civilized, quote unquote, uh, Christian Europe could say, we are not this. So here's a stained glass window from one of the churches. Uh, you've got the knight is what a human should be, and the angels are the sublime that the that humans should be striving for, and we've evolved out of our wild man natures. And so there's something that the Europeans could say is, ugh, we're not that, do you see? So it's a negative definition of what you could be. That's what the old wild man was. Now, is that Hagrid? Is that how we see Hagrid today? Not at all. We see Hagrid in these terms. So as disillusionment with civilized society set in, so approximately around this time, you know, the, 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 age of, the Renaissance, the Age of Enlightenment, the Christian uh, focus on the divine in us, it started to wear thin as all of, all of these cultural tendencies tend to wax and wane. Uh, the pendulum swings one way or the other. And as, as disillusionment with uh, Christian society set in around this time, the myth of the wild man came to be represented uh, by over-civilized Europeans as a romantic figure. So once we got kind of tired of living in cities so much and living this Malfoyan uh, kind of uh, prim existence, our animal, our Fred and George, our Hagrid energy started to, to, to make themselves felt and we started to yearn for a return to nature. And return to nature movements are happening all the time in, different, in waves depending on the, the, the zeitgeist, depending on the spirit of the times, do you see? So we came to see the wild man as a kind of romantic figure, a pure spirit, a noble savage living free of the suffocating constraints of a highly ordered Christian society. Again, I think that's represented in umbrage as we've talked about in this video, umbrage represents that too much order and eventually it's going to lead to a psychic backlash. I'm tired of living in this prim, uh, this prim existence. I need some wildness. I need to release the wild man in me, do you see? So to the Malfoys, Hagrid is the negative. Hagrid, uh, the Malfoys see themselves as angels. They see themselves as superior to all creatures and the low is the low. It's the low and the dirty and the despicable, do you see? But to Harry and the gang, and to the readers, we love Hagrid, and we see Hagrid as the pure woodland earth god, absolutely. And we see the Game of Thrones, too. If you've watched the Game of Thrones, uh, Tonks, this is the character that plays Tonks in the movies, uh, she plays a wildling. And the wildlings in Game of Thrones, they're right on the edge. They've got enough of the wild that makes them attractive, and we don't see them as necessarily evil. We see them as a, as a, as a positive force, as this free spirit. Now, they've got their wild wildlings, you see, they go too far, but they've certainly got their Hagrid-ish kind of wildlings as well, and Tonks was one of them. She had one foot in the wild world and one, one foot in the one foot in the Bacchus Dionysian wild world and one foot in the Apollonian because she helped out uh, 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 Bran. She helped out Bran who was a, definitely a Dumbledore character, a spiritual Apollonian character because he was spiritually in tune with the universe. Okay, so interesting stuff. There's Hagrid the Wild Man. Look it up. Look up Wild Man. Look up Green Man. Have a, have a, and, and let me know what you think in the comments below.